Hello, hello there and welcome back to War Thunder. Today I want to talk about torpedoes with my guest Drakinifel. For those of you who don't know him, he is very much into ships, technology about ships from the age of sail, ironclads, you know, up to the First World War, interwar period, Second World War and everything after that. So yeah, today's topic is torpedoes. Last uh, time's topic was mines and they actually kind of kick off together. So hello there. Hello. Yes, today, the last time we were talking about stationary balls of death, now we are talking about self-propelled balls of death. So we're getting closer. <laughs> so about torpedoes, um, I don't know, it's kind of a name from a um, from a fish, if I'm not mistaken, uh, relative to sharks. And uh, I think it's a stingray, isn't it? Yes, well, there's some, some hypothesis that the term torpedo was given to these kinds of explosive devices because of exactly that kind of uh, the painful sting that you got from an unexpected source. Um, but the, the torpedoes were a catch-all term that covered both mines and what we would today recognize as torpedoes uh, in the 19th century. And they only really diverged one from the other in the 1860s, around the time of the American Civil War. Okay, so they are practically a newer weapon compared to mines that have their origin in the deepest depths of uh, Southeast Asia somewhere. Um, as we, you know, talked about in last video. So, yeah, how did it really kick off? Um, what were the diversive... Um, attempts to use them and how were they used successfully or not so successfully um, how did it really start in naval warfare with torpedoes well there were two parallel developments in the 1860s um, there was the torpedo that we would recognize and there was also a bit of an evolutionary dead end which was the spar torpedo and the spar torpedo can effectively be described as a bomb on a stick and as crazy as it sounds back in the 19th century people actually thought sticking a bunch of explosives on the end of a long stick and uh, basically wandering up to your enemy and poking them with it and hopefully blowing them up was a good idea uh, so the first distinctive use of that kind of technology was in the American Civil War the relatively famous Confederate submarine Hunley versus USS Housatonic but that also demonstrated the main weakness of the spar torpedo which is that you can't get a stick that's tremendously long so when you're setting off an explosive at the other end of the stick you're going to get hit almost as badly as your target and the Hundley promptly sank when the explosive went off later refinements in the spar torpedo including the idea of sticking it on a boat rather than a sort of semi-submersible were a little bit more successful so you had in the little known Romanian War of Independence uh, the Romanians got their hands on a spar torpedo boat called the Randus uh, I think it's Randun Randunica and that actually managed to sink an Ottoman monitor called the Safi without blowing itself up which was a, a ma major accomplishment but as you might imagine sort of explosive on the end of a stick was pretty much uh, an evolutionary dead end and that was pretty much the last major use of the spar torpedo in operational warfare instead what you had at the same time is say in the 1860s was the development of what was initially known as a whitehead which was named after the uh, british inventor but ironically enough he wasn't working for britain at the time he was actually working for austria hungary and um, he invented a self-propelled torpedo in conjunction with some others and that torpedo was initially, believe it or not, powered by clockwork. It ran on the surface and it was steered by ropes. Um, and now as, as hilarious as a slowly ticking alarm clock full of explosive might actually seem, its range and speed were pretty pathetic. So he kept working on it and eventually he came up with a method to replace the clockwork engine with compressed air. He changed it from looking a bit like a slightly aggressive canoe to the tubular form that we rec would recognize today. And that came about in uh, the mid-1860s, 1866 precisely. 
but his next problem was the fact that because the torpedo's center of gravity would always change and there was currents and uh, other and wave motion the torpedo would dive and rise and dive and rise completely at random so you had no idea where it was going to be at any given time even assuming it stayed in a straight line so he invented what was then called the whitehead secret um, which was a valve, a hydrostatic valve and a pendulum which would adjust the hydroplanes to a given setting which actually allowed the torpedo to maintain a constant depth which was somewhat important because you didn't want the torpedo to pop up onto the surface where someone could shoot it but you also didn't want it diving so deep that it missed the ship entirely. So by the end of that decade in 1870 he'd developed a torpedo that could run about a thousand yards with a gun cotton warhead but it only had a speed of six knots, which meant that a particularly strong current could actually um, push your ship away faster than the torpedo could catch up with you. But he kept working on it, and uh, over the next 20 years it was developed into a weapon that by the 1890s could hit 30 knots, which was a little bit more threatening, although the range was still fairly short. So, yeah, those were the torpedoes in the early days were there actually any sort of onboard countermeasures to them aside from just trying to you know dodge it or to change speed um not initially i mean that there, there were actually attempts to make wire guided torpedoes it became very evident that this was never going to work from a ship at the time but there were some torpedoes that would have a little flag stuck on them and that would stick up above the water and then using the wires you could guide them from a shore installation. Now obviously you could then disrupt where that torpedo was going by shooting at the people who were guiding it on the shore, um, but as a, as a crude and early form of homing torpedo, or I guess guided torpedo, um, they were actually fairly advanced for their time and the Royal Navy used them to protect bases across the world for a couple of decades towards the end of the 19th century, um, mainly retiring them down to the fact that they had, uh, again, this kind of short range and low speed that lots of early torpedoes um, suffered from and they, they tried various ways I mean the, the Americans actually tried a torpedo that was driven by a giant flywheel uh, which had the added advantage of having no uh, wake because there wasn't any combustion going on board but that had limited range because you could only spin the flywheel up to so many revolutions uh, and the Germans obviously got their hands on the secrets of torpedo construction and started building them as well in the in the 19th century so yeah, there weren't too many ways to evade them other than either get out the way or because of the short range, actually just shoot the thing that was coming at you with torpedoes. And this was, among other things, what drove the development of the quick firing naval gun, because a small fast boat, um, you needed to shoot at it, but it was fairly unlikely you would hit with any one shot. So that, that increased the demand for a gun that could fire very, very quickly so that you could hopefully score at least one or two hits before the torpedo boat got in range. Huh, that's actually interesting that the quick firing guns were, you know, developed because of this. Then up to the run up to the First World War, um, was there a significant change in terms of speed, size and range and also the uh, aiming systems other than by, you know, um, you know, pu putting the thumb across the uh, ship and just give it the direction? Yeah, so um, the single biggest innovation in guidance was the installation of a gyroscope. And the gyroscope meant that the torpedo was more likely to run in a straight line, um, even if it got hit by currents and uh, other things. So there, and obviously they also installed contra-rotating propellers, which is basically two propellers turning in opposite directions, which meant that the torque of the propeller wouldn't twist the torpedo um, and make it go rolling off to one side or the other so they'd solved the full 3d range of motion and they could relatively easily rely on the fact that the torpedo would go where you pointed it um, which was fairly helpful and they mainly worked at increasing the range because the first torpedoes had been powered by compressed air but by world war one they had decided that it was much better to run it using a motor that was burning fuel which obviously being underwater didn't have access to air so the compressed air tank still remained but that was there purely to feed um, oxidizer in the form of oxygen to the fuel so that the fuel could burn and then the output of that 
uh, through the motor would provide the range. So by World War One, you were talking about torpedoes generally the most common ones could have a range of between a kilometer and a half and two and a half kilometers at top speed which had increased about 35 knots give or take a bit depending on exactly whose torpedo you're talking about um, or they could go maybe between three and five kilometers if they were set to a slightly lower running speed of sort of 25 to 27 knots although with the disadvantage that at that kind of speed a particularly fast ship like a battle cruiser um, a light or protected cruiser or a destroyer might well be able to outrun the torpedo. Okay, so that was actually the curious thing that a lot of the uh, dreadnought era, uh, the dreadnought era battleships had actually uh, underwater tubes, and um, as far as I know, they were actually never successfully used in combat to hit another ship. Um, not in World War One, certainly. There is some debate as to whether or not HMS Rodney managed to score a torpedo hit on the Bismarck at the end of its engagement in World War Two, which, if true, would constitute the only successful torpedoing of a battleship by another battleship, um, which would be quite amusing considering that it came about at, the, at a time when practically everybody had long ago given up on torpedoes mounted on battleships and the the Rodney basically only had them because no one had bothered to take them off <laughs> yeah um then going back to world war one um when i read about the supply situation of uh, great britain in the first world war there was already a threat from submarines and um, how effective were they actually in the commerce rate in the uh, destroying the uh, British supply lines? Well, submarines were quite effective because up until that point, the main worry about raiders had been obviously surface ships. And surface ships you could guard against with guns and you could see them coming, so it wasn't so much of a problem um, because you could shoot back. The main problem with submarines was that you couldn't see them, um, which negated the vast numerical superiority that the Royal Navy had. S um, at the time, torpedoes were still fairly expensive weapons, and submarines, being relatively small, didn't carry that many of them. And compared to a shell, they're quite large. So a lot of U-boats in World War One would actually generally tend to operate on the basis of surfacing and using their deck guns to engage so they're kind of like very small commerce raiders in the traditional manner just using their underwater capabilities to stealthily move around and ambush ships but where they could and where it was practical they would use their torpedoes as well um, so larger targets would get sunk by torpedoes or if they felt there were too many escorts or there was a chance that the ship might be armed and shoot back um, then they would use their torpedoes and obviously as ship as uh, u-boats got larger and larger throughout World War One, with more and more torpedoes on board, they'd use them uh, more commonly. Uh, they did have quite a number of successes early, early on in the war against uh, Royal Navy ships, mainly because the combination of submarine and torpedo was uh, an untested weapon as far as combat situations went. So you had a rather famous incident where three British armoured cruisers, the Abakir, Hogue and Cressy, were sailing along uh, a U-boat saw them, torpedoed one of them, and the other two assumed that the ship must have hit a mine because they couldn't see anybody nearby, so clearly it couldn't have been enemy action, so they stopped to uh, get survivors off the ship, and of course the German captain saw two more British armoured cruisers had stopped and presenting sitting ducks as a target, so he just went, oh, okay, I'll just put torpedo into both of those as well, so one after the other, all three armoured cruisers were sunk. Um pretty much up until almost the last minute not realizing what what was going on okay um then talking about probably one of the biggest if not the biggest naval engagements in history in modern times the battle of Jutland, the clash of you know the german battle line with the british home fleet and um, while the Germans won the battle cruiser battle, the British had the decisive advantage than when it actually came to the main fleets. And the Germans were actually trying to escape. And um, as far as I can make out, one of the decisive factors in allowing the Germans 
to actually uh, get out of the range in daylight from the British guns was the ordering the destroyers to make some torpedo attacks with the famous quote run and find and um, yeah then actually Chalico said nope and ordered his turn uh, and uh, ordered his fleet to turn around yeah and th this was basically because of the cost effectiveness of torpedoes um, as we discussed in the mines episode uh, Jellicoe knew the Grand Fleet had already lost one of its super dreadnoughts the Audacious to a single mine now whilst they'd uh, tried to improve their anti uh, underwater explosion protection and obviously they were at full combat stations he was still very conscious that a lot of his ships were somewhat vulnerable to being hit by underwater explosives and effectively came down to the fact that Jellico knew that if the status quo that had existed before the battle started was maintained then that was a net positive for Britain because Britain held control of the oceans the only way that battle ended badly for the British was if they lost and pretty much at that point with the numbers and gunnery advantage that Jellicoe had he knew that the only way the Germans could decisively tip the balance of power on the field in their favour was to suddenly sink or cripple a number of his capital ships without um, getting more of their own ships damaged and the torpedo was the perfect weapon to do that because even if a third of the German destroyers had been wiped out, and obviously most of them did survive, but even if they had taken massive losses, if the Royal Navy had sailed straight into the teeth of their torpedo attack and three or four dreadnoughts had been knocked out, the, the cost-benefit ratio to the Germans would have been astronomically in their favour. Um, and so knowing that, Jellico decided that there was there was absolutely no point in trying to charge down torpedoes on the off chance that he might be able to catch the Germans and he might avoid taking fairly significant casualties. So as you say, he, he turned away from the torpedo attack and let the torpedoes run their course and um, run out of, of fuel and then thought, well, then I can turn back and pursue them, uh, which he did and he almost caught them, but uh, obviously, as we know, he didn't quite manage to do that, and that was uh, pretty much that as far as the British chances of bringing the High Seas Fleet to a decisive battle that day um, were. Yeah, so then, kind of in the First World War, the torpedo established itself as a very dangerous threat to even the biggest ships and um, being able to sink them bypass the protection that the main armor belts actually provided. So how did the development continue in the interwar period um, after the First World War to the run-up to the Second World War? Um, there were quite some interesting development ideas and um, actually the forecasting shadow of some of the biggest fails in history of, um, I guess, naval development yeah so the interwar period um the various navies had limited budgets and so they tended to concentrate most of that development into ships rather than torpedoes the sole exception to that being the japanese navy uh, because the japanese navy was left at a 10 versus 15 disadvantage against the royal navy or the american uh, navy in capital ships so whilst the British and the Americans were still concentrating on sort of a big battleship duel for most of the interwar period and viewed torpedoes as either an annoying threat to be guarded against with destroyers or as a way of slowing or crippling some of the enemy fleet the Japanese knew they were never going to win a, a stand-up gunfight because they'd just be outnumbered so they decided that the best way of evening the odds would be massive torpedo attacks before any kind of major fleet battle developed and so starting with the late world war one period they worked on and off on so, uh, replacing the compressed air in their torpedoes with pure oxygen which obviously since oxygen is only 21 percent of compressed air it gave them about five times the burnable oxygen and a lot less waste pros waste products um, in the combustion process which meant that the resulting torpedo which turned out to be the long lance 
had a significantly greater range and uh, was a big torpedo anyway, so it could carry a fairly significant warhead. And on top of that, it had the advantage of, because it had so much so much less waste product in terms of uh, exhaust gases it was also fairly stealthy for a torpedo um, so that 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 was set up um, they carried on experiments with aerial torpedoes um, the first aerial torpedoing had happened in world war one although amusingly enough it actually happened when the seaplane carrying the torpedo had um, had developed a faulty engine and had to land on the ocean to repair it then it noticed a steamer and the pilot sort of tooled the engine up to low power and meandered over using his seaplane as a kind of tiny boat and dropped the torpedo that way um and then event and then went back to fixing his plane while this target sank in the background um but they kept working on that as a method of delivery because uh, they bit battles like jutland and heligoland bite and things like that had shown that basically submarines were too slow and destroyers were vulnerable so getting aircraft to deliver torpedoes quite quickly was seen as a as, as a thing to pursue uh, especially because obviously they could reach out far beyond the fleet and uh, everyone was thinking in mostly in terms of aircraft uh, crippling or slowing the enemy ships so that you could bring them to action which was uh, seen as a way of uh, forcing action especially for the British and American fleets who were aware that the Japanese fleet was faster than them in battle line terms and the americans with the standard class were aware that everybody was faster than them in battle line terms so they definitely if they wanted to bring somebody to battle would need to slow them down somehow um but as the 1930s turned into the 1940s everyone had also realized that armor and torpedo bulge protection that had been built into new ships and retrofitted onto existing ships was possibly going to be able to defeat incoming torpedoes so they'd switched to a new technology which was the magnetic detonator which was designed to detonate a torpedo underneath a ship instead of in contact with the side of a ship which would in theory then allow them to bypass most of the anti-torpedo defenses and cause a lot more damage to a ship but there were a few problems with that. <laughs> yeah, so um, talking about the magnetic detonator, it was actually something that sounds, uh, even by today's standards, like something absolutely modern and in innovative, um, especially how it deals damage to the ship. So um, we see it with some of the modern kind of tests that you you see just the ship just disappear in a mighty column of water and um, before that you see kind of the ocean um, getting um, into a light flash circle so that is just that the torpedo detonated under the ship in the best circumstances and then there was the shock then there was the gas bubble that the ship fell into after it has previously been lifted, uh, breaking, breaking the back of the ship for the first time, and then the second water column smashing against the bottom of the hull again, and that was devastating, even from a relatively small uh, um, torpedo versus a relatively big ship, bypassing the previously um, getting more and more advanced defensive systems, making them rather look obsolete. Yeah, and it, one of the biggest advantages when these things worked was the fact that as opposed to a contact detonation, which effectively had to brute force its way through the ship's defences, and as we, as you see with the, actually with the Bismarck engagement, a number of contact detonated torpedoes hit the middle of the ship and basically don't do all that much because the, the defences hold, um, whereas a magnetic torpedo... Uh, by bypassing all of those systems with the creation of this bubble underneath the ship it actually makes the ship fight itself so whereas with a contact detonated torpedo the bigger and nastier the ship um, the heavier it is the more protection it's got the better it is able to resist a contact detonation those very same features of being massive and uh, extremely heavy work against it when you're dealing with an under keel detonation um, by a sufficiently sized warhead stuck on a magnetic detonator. So yeah, that is so practically the new age of um, torpedo development, but it came 
uh, at a price um, and actually it went to the reliability of the torpedo actually working partially because the or actually because the fuses themselves the magnetic sensors were either oversensitive and there was a change depending where you use them in the earth's magnetic field and so um funnily enough um in norway the germans got kind of robbed a lot of big ship kills or at least severely damaging um you know big naval uh, big capital ships yeah um yeah basically um the germans the british and the americans had all arrived at magnetic detonators in various ways shapes and forms on their own um but everyone had failed as you said to account for the earth's magnetic field and to be fair you can kind of see why that would be the case initially because when they're testing them in their own country the magnetic field in any given country is pretty much the same um, especially within the confines of sort of secret testing areas um, but they with the variances that you got across the planet it meant that uh, a torpedo that was calibrated in Bremen wouldn't work in Norway or a torpedo that was calibrated in Portsmouth would be practically useless near the equator or in the Americans case something that was calibrated in Los Angeles you take it across the Pacific and uh, the settings are completely faulty um, it, it depended on the country um, the British believe it or not for once their weapons were actually working better than everyone else's out of the box there wasn't anything particularly wrong with their torpedoes it was purely that the magnetic um, detonators were far too sensitive so again referencing the Bismarck engagement the first uh, strike that was flown off against it by Ark Royal the magnetic detonators just completely failed to work which was actually fortunate because they were accidentally attacking HMS Sheffield but by flying back they just took the next lot of torpedoes switched out the magnetic detonators for the old contact detonators and they worked fine um, the German torpedoes had slightly more problems because they also had issues keeping a constant depth. But when the U-boat captains came back in and reported the problems, the Kriegsmarine were fairly efficient about it and said, OK, you've got these problems. Let's have a look. Let's test it. OK, right. There's the problem. Let's fix it. And in relatively short order, um, once they'd also fixed the problems with the detonators, the U-boats had effective torpedoes again not so much in america <laughs> yeah so um i actually didn't know about this for quite a long time um and which is very surprising given the effect that it had and on the lucky receiving end of this massive failure was actually the japanese shipping that actually you know was very inefficient in the anti-submarine warfare but then you know if you are um, you know not very successful um, you know fighting off this threat but then the threat turns out to not be that much of a threat it kind of cancels it out so the american torpedo disaster was actually quite hilarious and um, i hope you can talk us through this yeah so the mark 14 torpedo um, much cursed by many a U.S. sailor, was developed in peacetime, but the Bureau of Ordnance was so penny-pinching they decided it was far too expensive to actually test a torpedo for real, um, so they did all sorts of um, semi real tests sort of tests where it would run with a dummy warhead and things like this which obviously were completely different to live operational tests so when the american submariners went out as you said the japanese were terrible anti-submarine warfare so they got loads of really good shots lined up and they would fire torpedo after torpedo after torpedo and unlike practically anywhere in the world they could deliberately fire off one after the other their entire forward complement of torpedoes go away reload come back again fire another full spread of torpedoes and the japanese target would have absolutely no idea what the heck was going on um but every single torpedo would either miss horribly or fail to detonate and they were completely uh, sort of completely bamboozled as to what the heck was happening and it turned out well the magnetic detonators were crap <laughs> and there's no real way of putting it uh, any kinder 
So much as the British had done, they thought, right, well, let's replace them with contact detonators. It turned out the contact detonators, if you can believe it, were too fragile. They would actually break before they detonate. Um, so it turned out that uh, rather than having a torpedo that would detonate under a ship's keel, they had a torpedo that would only detonate on contact, and they had to, to deliberately try and engineer a shot to strike the enemy ship at an angle of about 30 degrees, because if you hit the ship uh, almost sort of 90 degrees sideways on as you'd like to, the detonator would break. And if you hit the ship at much more than 30 degrees, the torpedo would break because it was coming in at too, uh, too much of an angle. So you were left with this incredibly narrow margin where the detonator would even work, which was um, obviously not ideal. And on top of all that, it turned out the torpedo actually also ran too deep. Um, so even if you managed to set up this near impossible shot, you had a very high likelihood of the torpedo just diving down to sort of way way below the depth of the ship's keel and merrily sailing off into the ocean to sort of blow up a coral reef or some unfortunate flounder on the on the ocean floor um and all of these problems were solvable and eventually did end up being solved but the ultimate failure of all of this was actually the bureau of ordnance and uh listeners to my own channel will be familiar with this little story because i've told it a couple of times but basically the bureau of ordnance was so determined to cover its own backside and pretend that nothing was wrong that they absolutely refused to believe that there was a problem they told the u.s submarine captains that they were the problem the u.s submarine captains obviously knew that they weren't a, the problem and the Bureau of Ordnance not only refused to do any tests uh, for the most part, but when American submarine captains did their own tests unauthorized in the Pacific and then said, look, we've tested our torpedoes live in a control environment. We can prove they're not working properly. Here's all the evidence. The first thing the Bureau of Ordnance tried to do was bring them up on charges for, un for unauthorized expenditure of ammunition. Um, so wonderful bit of bureaucraties there. Um, and bearing in mind that America entered the war in late 1941, it took them nearly until the end of 1943 before uh, mounting pressure from the US Navy and eventually various members of Congress managed to get Bureau of Ordnance to admit that yes, perhaps they had actually made a mistake and they weren't perfect. And they eventually, um, over time, managed to get to fixing the Mark 14 which, once all the issues were fixed, turned out to be uh, underlying a fairly sound torpedo that would then go on to devastate the Japanese, who had completely failed to take any notice of the previous two years of astounding good luck on their part. Um, and the Mark 14 would go on to reap quite the toll of Japanese shipping in the late war. Um, but, to be honest, if we, when you periodically get one of these questions about, oh, how, how could the war in the Pacific have been shortened. Probably the single easiest and most obvious answer to significantly shorten the course of the war in the Pacific would have been get Bureau of Ordnance to actually do their damn jobs properly. Um, because then a lot more of the Japanese Navy would have been on the bottom <laughs> at the early part of the war. Yeah, so how actually, I think the Japanese got some warning about that there were torpedoes in the water when they returned to harbor with torpedoes stuck in their hull. Um, so um, that was kind of amusing um, in retrospect for the people not being involved um, either on the side of the trigger or on the receiving end. So um, yeah, then actually about the aircraft carriers, at which point turned they out to be really lethal with their um, torpedoes? How was the development going on on such torpedoes? Because I cannot imagine uh, aircraft carrying such a heavy weapon. So were they scaled down? Yeah, well, um, torpedoes came in a variety of calibers. Um, it obviously depended. Germans would use metric. Uh, the British and Americans were using imperial. Um, but there, there were heavyweight torpedoes and lightweight torpedoes. So most aircraft-borne torpedoes tended to be 18 inches in diameter, whereas most submarine and ship launch torpedoes would be 21 or 24 inches in diameter, which would be obviously significantly heavier. Um, and longer range, but with an aircraft it didn't matter. The range didn't matter so much because you were flying up to the target. Um, in terms of the effectiveness, the obviously there were advances in the aerial torpedoes in the interwar period, but the main 
two players in effectiveness for aerial torpedoes came about basically as the war turned into uh, sort of the, the major part of the conflict in the 1940 and 1941 and that involved the introduction of two things one of which was coordinating your strikes because as um, various people found out i mean with during the channel dash when you had the swordfish trying to stop Scharnhorst and Gneisenau and Prince Eugen and um, in the early battles of the Pacific if you send small groups of half a dozen or a dozen torpedo planes out sort of randomly scattered about they're very easy prey for anti-aircraft fire and fighter planes so the ability to coordinate larger strikes was absolutely critical but this was something that was only really being developed just as World War II started so 1939 people had tried but not tremendously successfully, uh, as was proved by their efforts in the early part of the war. Um, but the British strike at Taranto, which involved just under two squadrons of swordfish, was studied by all sides, and then, of course, the Japanese did it much bigger and better at Pearl Harbor. Uh, the other half of the equation was, of course, the aircraft, and the torpedo bombers in the late 1930s were pretty slow, pretty fragile, pretty pathetic things that would have been made mincemeat of. Um, in World War II, but a whole generation of new torpedo bombers came in right at that sort of the turn of the decade. So you had eventually things like the Avenger torpedo bomber, which was excellent, um, succeeding the Devastator torpedo bomber, whose only devastating effect was to its own crews because it just tended to get shot down in droves. The only strange and bizarre exception to this appeared to be the Swordfish, which on paper and by all metrics was a terrible, ancient, slow, dilapidated and outdated biplane, but outside of the Channel Dash seemed to score a series of absolutely absurd one-sided victories where it had no real right to yeah so um let's talk about uh, the further part on the other side what were the um, torpedo defense systems in particular you know the bouncing bomb incident um, the reason why they didn't use simply torpedoes was because the Germans were actually smart enough to protect their dams by torpedo nets so how did those torpedo nets work did they um, trigger the fuse of the torpedo or did they just slow the uh, torpedo down and just you know entangle it and just had no chance of hitting the target um, it depended on exactly which torpedo nets people were using but generally for fixed defenses like what they had on the Myrna, Ida and Sorp dams um, they were big heavyweight nets um, that were designed to catch and detonate torpedoes as much as possible. You also saw this um, when uh, Tirpitz was in the Norwegian fjords, they put some out there as well. Um, because th what people forget, especially when they're playing games and such where torpedoes look like they're really small, is that a torpedo is often over 20 feet long, so we're talking four or five meters or more. And so it's something that weighs two or three tons and at this point in the war they're traveling at the better part of 35 40 knots so that's sort of 50 miles an hour maybe 60 65 kilometers an hour so you're effectively talking about something with enough with the kinetic energy let alone the explosive energy similar to a fairly heavily laden um, like Ford Transit or some other kind of large van. If you imagine a large van full of heavy materials moving at about the speed that you'd find on a slower highway, now imagine that just plowing at that speed without trying to break into something. That's an awful lot of kinetic energy, even assuming it's not full of explosive. So if you have a net that's made of heavy steel mesh and something like that comes barreling along and slams into it, it's either going to break up or detonate. Okay. And um, I've read somewhere that in the uh, Arctic convoys, some of the destroyers uh, trying to fight off the German torpedo planes actually also try to destroy the, um, the torpedoes, not just by shooting at them with the various kind of weapons of them, but also trying to disturb the um, guiding system by dropping some depth charges in their way. And that seemed to have been kind of sometimes successful. 
Yeah, I mean, th this was helped by the fact that by this point the uh, Royal Navy had a depth charge throwers rather than um, just chucking them off the back, uh, which let them get a bit more range. But the, the general idea was that, as we mentioned uh, much earlier, that torpedoes were guided by gyroscopes to keep them on course and uh, a, a pressure valves and pendulums to keep them at the right depth. Now all of these things are fairly sensitive to shock and overpressure and the idea of firing large explosives into the water ahead of them was that the shock wave of the explosive would either rupture the valve or knock over the gyroscope or both um, and this would then disrupt the torpedo's ability to guide itself because these systems were fairly robust but they weren't robust enough to withstand the pressure of a short-range explosion so the idea was if you could knock these systems out then the torpedo would be subject to the wind and the waves and the currents and its own changing center of gravity as it burned up fuel which would then result in the torpedo near enough certainly not actually going anywhere near where you where you aimed it um, so yeah that that was the idea behind that and it's pr that's pretty much the only way to be honest of of getting a straight line running torpedo from not going where you where it's intending to go yeah so the uh, next quantum leap in terms of torpedo technology as far as i can tell came again from the germans and it is one of those um, you know celebrated nazi wonder weapons the Zaunkönig, which actually was a guided torpedo and it was kind of um, looking for any so sort of uh, sound source and actually followed it. And this actually was very interesting because it not just was easier to aim, but it also shortened the time to uh, aim it, to lead it. And, you know, the aiming and leading of a torpedo was a, you know, complicated business. Um, even more complicated than uh, naval artillery gunfire, you know, uh, leading. And um, when it hit, it actually mostly hit kind of the propellers, kind of hit the engine room. And this is where it did practically the most damage that you could do with a contact fuse. Or did they only have contact fuses? Um, yeah, gen generally, they well, they, they tried a mixture of contact and magnetic fuses, but contact fuses were better for the acoustic torpedo because the acoustic torpedo was homing in, as you said, right on the engine, so you might as well, uh, and the propellers, so you might as well get as close in as you can because those areas are vulnerable. Uh, and also it's slightly less complicated, which if you've got a complex weapon like an acoustic homing torpedo, it's best not to introduce too many points of failure. Um, yeah, the, the, the idea of the acoustic torpedo, as you said, was to, to home in on noise, which meant that in theory um, you may not even have to put your periscope up because if you if you could rely on your um, hydro phones, then you could estimate a range and speed to a target and just fire a torpedo on that bearing, which is kind of similar to actually how they operate passive sonar today. Um, but the single biggest danger of them apart from the fact that they could home in which meant that standard evasive patterns were actually counterintuitive because if you were being shot at by a straight running torpedo you'd run your engines to max and try and be in a different place to where the enemy had thought you were going to be whereas with an acoustic torpedo the minute you put your engines to full revs you're actually just making yourself a bigger target and an easier target for the acoustic homer um, and once it actually hits Obviously, where the propeller shafts exit the ship is the one place underwater where a ship deliberately and intentionally has a large hole in the hull. So if you can either break the seals and the, the glands on that propeller shaft, or better yet, detach the propeller shaft from what they call the mounting skegs, which are the stabilizing brackets outside the hull, that can potentially kill a ship very, very easily because it's going to open up a really nice long tunnel which is going to lead water right into the biggest room on the ship which is the engine room um, and if it floods the boilers the ship has no power so it can't pump that water out so it's fairly doomed and if you're really really lucky um, you might also if you damage or bend the propeller shaft you might get it to sort of whirl round and round as opposed to just spinning in place which could then rip open a huge uh, hole in the ship and admit even more water. 
okay so um that sounds like you know an actual an actual german nazi wonder weapon so how effective were they how terrified were the allies what kind of range had they and uh, tried the allies some sort of countermeasures their effective range was slightly less than the straight running torpedoes purely because obviously the, they were maneuvering um, and chasing things down so every time they turned they would lose a bit of energy which they then have to gain back so they, they would basically they would burn through their total energy um, a little bit quicker so but the range wasn't that much reduced um, the allies were quite worried about them um, the very very first ones had a habit of exploding in the wake of the ship which gave them a few s surprises and shocks but once that was fixed and they started hitting ships in the stern the allies were very worried about it because as I said the, the tactics when you saw an acoustic torpedo compared to a straight running torpedo were completely the opposite um, with a straight running torpedo you ran away as fast as possible but that was the exact wrong thing to do with an acoustic torpedo and now you had to make a sort of a coin flip guess of what kind of torpedo was it because if it was an acoustic torpedo your best bet was actually to shut all your engines down and go as quiet as possible but obviously that made you a sitting target if the torpedo was actually just a straight runner or the submarine was still there and could just fire another straight running torpedo at you um, in terms of decoys and uh, countermeasures the two main things they did was just create more noise elsewhere um, which was obviously uh, a, a semi-effective tactic because the acoustic homer would tend to lock onto the loudest noise source so if you could create a, a noise that could distract it then that give you time to get away as at home done on that and then later on they would also have uh, sort of full towed decoys which they still use to an extent on modern ships uh, which was basically basically the idea was <coughs> to create a larger sound signature coming from the ship but a, a more diffuse one so that then the torpedo would home in on the overall sound signature and that would effectively recreate the problem the Germans were having initially of the torpedo exploding maybe 20-30 yards behind the ship where it didn't do that much damage. Okay. So I think that's everything uh, interesting in the Second World War, which kind of, you know, is, uh, is a time of major developments on the wartime. Uh, many countries were trying to develop, you know, advanced weapons. And it was just the time where um, a lot of the weapons were developed for the um, time after or for the future in basic. And what were then the big quantum leaps uh, in post-war time? Um, what I can think of is from, you know, nuclear-powered submarines that you fire those wire-guided torpedoes. And um, did they actually manage to make those, um, you know, those magnetic detonators work? Yeah, they managed to make the magnetic detonators work eventually. Um, but these days they are to a degree superseded by the fact that the, the sensors on board torpedoes have gotten a lot more sophisticated. So most torpedoes these days will have an onboard sonar system, both a passive system to help them home in pretty much in the same way that the acoustic torpedoes did, um, although some of them home in on the wake of the ship rather than the noise, um, and an active sonar system which they can obviously use to go ping, ping, ping and find out where the ship is, uh, where their target is that way. Um, but because obviously a torpedo is much smaller than a submarine or a ship, the systems are smaller and lower powered than the systems on their launching vessel. So they have to get quite close before they can, they can activate those. The main change, uh, apart from that sort of more advanced guidance system that you see in modern torpedoes is a development in the fuels. So obviously the Japanese had the pure oxygen, but that had the annoying habit of turning their ships into gigantic floating bombs um, because pure oxygen, surprisingly enough, burns incredibly well. Um, the Germans tried to use hydrogen peroxide instead. Um, that had the wonderful advantage of not only being almost as explosive as pure oxygen, but also being incredibly corrosive and toxic. Um, so peroxide fuel torpedoes didn't last that long um, except 
on training torpedoes in the Russian Navy, which, um, as far as anyone can tell, seems to be the most likely contender for the sinking of the submarine Kursk, because you really don't want that fuel leaking anywhere, because otherwise it all goes boom. Um, they, they also have tried electric torpedoes, which, um, as the name suggests, are powered by batteries and obviously have practically zero wake and are fairly quiet. Um, the main problem with those, as with electric cars um, on the roads, is that the energy density in batteries is significantly less than that available in fuel. Um, so they either can go as fast but not as far, or as far but not as fast, which is a bit of a disadvantage. Um, but they've also tried all sorts of weird and wonderful propellants. So you've got things like the British Spearfish torpedo, which uses a gas turbine, which is effectively a miniaturized version of the propulsion system on most modern uh, surface warships. Uh, other torpedoes use what are called monopropellants. So rather than burning a fuel and an oxidizer, the, the fuel that they use is self-oxidizing, um, which in theory gives you maximum possible efficiency. Um, and other some really weird ones like spraying very complicated gases over blocks of catalyst material to produce energy as well basically just trying to increase the speed and range of torpedoes as much as possible okay so which kind of range can you expect from a modern torpedo so as with um, torpedoes back in the First and Second World War, most torpedoes have uh, what they call almost a, a cruise speed, where their range is quite significant. So at that kind, at those speeds, you can get a torpedo that might go anything from 40 to 60 kilometers, maybe more. Um, obviously, the exact details are classified, um, and, but that's that kind of speed. They'll run at maybe somewhere between 25 and 35 knots, depending on the torpedo. Um, and then they'll also have a fast mode where they're running obviously not quite as efficiently um, so they won't go as far but they're running full full speed and at that kind of range uh, that kind of speed sorry then the range drops to maybe 30 kilometers give or take um, but the speed will tend to go up in sort of the high 40s which obviously means you can close the enemy down a lot faster and uh, limits their amount of time that they can respond. The two notable exceptions to that rule are, in terms of speed are the British Spearfish torpedo, which as I said earlier uses gas turbine and through some kind of techno sorcery involved in that manages to run for nearly 25 kilometers at the high speed setting at nearly 80 knots. Um, which is just insane because that translates to pretty much a speed that you wouldn't see outside of an autobahn on a good day. Uh, you're talking about n near enough 100 miles an hour, more than, more than 120 kilometers an hour. That is a scary speed for uh, <laughs> a several ton lump of explosive to be moving through the water at. And the other one is the Russian rocket propelled torpedo. Uh, the I believe it's the Shukval. And that is literally, as it sounds, basically a missile with a solid rocket motor that uses a specially shaped nose and exhaust gases from the rocket to create what's called a super cavitating bubble around the torpedo, which is effectively a very, very small air pocket so that the missile, even though it's traveling underwater, uh, as far as the aerodynamics and resistance are concerned, it's mostly actually traveling through air. But with the obvious drawback of if you're traveling in an air bubble your ability to sense what's going on around you is pretty limited so although they are the fastest at over 200 knots their ability to actually guide themselves is pretty minimal although at the same time if you're traveling at that kind of speed underwater and you know roughly where your target was you probably don't need that much in terms of course correction yeah so when we talk about this kind of concepts um, you know, some freaky thoughts would go into the direction of just put, you know, uh, to use just simply a rocket and then let it just uh, dump itself into the ocean near the ship and travel the last few hundred meters maybe underwater. Uh, was that tried? Was that successful? For mainly anti-submarine um, use, it was tried. So the Americans have a thing called um, ASROC, which is anti-submarine rocket, basically rocket-launched uh, torpedoes. Um, and then the Australians also came up with the ICARA, 
So whereas the ASROC system is a relatively short range basically torpedo with a rocket booster on it um, with a range of about five miles, the Ikara is actually a small full-fledged missile with a torpedo strapped underneath it. And you they primarily would use those against try to use those against submarines, although in theory you could use it against a ship as well. The main problem with using it against a ship is basically that um, above a certain speed hitting water is like hitting concrete and you don't really want to drop your torpedo onto concrete at high speed because it's just going to smash. So as with uh, torpedo bombers in World War II, in order to successfully deploy the torpedo, your missile or rocket or whatever it is has to slow down to a point that it can successfully drop the torpedo without breaking it. And if it does that against a ship, it means that in that final approach phase, the missile is going to be hilariously vulnerable to the ship's onboard defences, uh, which makes them somewhat less practical for use against shipping. But obviously, because a submarine can't shoot back against something that's in the air, it makes them theoretically very effective against um, enemy submarines. The only real reason that the Ikara went out of service and the Azrock isn't really as widespread as you might think it should be um, is partly down to that sort of slightly limited range of uh, 5 or 10 miles depending on which system you're looking at and the fact that somebody figured out you could just stick torpedoes on a helicopter and uh, use them to drop it and obviously the helicopter can go a lot further. Okay, so um, going back to the Second World War and the Japanese long launch torpedoes, um, they actually kind of were very effective in the early days because they caught the Americans uh, by surprise and some American heavy cruisers uh, felt that kind of a lot. But in return, there was this hilarious case where actually one um, Japanese heavy cruiser fell victim to its own torpedoes. How did that happen? Yeah, so that was um, in the Battle of Samar, the uh, the wonderful um, battle where a, lo a lot of implausible things that you would think shouldn't happen did happen. Um, the American ships were being chased not only by battleships, but also by um, cruisers, Japanese cruisers. And one of the Japanese uh, heavy cruisers, so we were talking about a ship with sort of multiple 8-inch guns, uh, full-sized um, secondary battery and heavy torpedo armament, um, was engaging the American carrier, uh, escort carriers and destroyer escorts. And one of the ships, which carried a single 5-inch gun, so a single destroyer caliber weapon, managed to land a hit on the cruiser's torpedo battery, which hadn't fired off yet, and all the long lances and all their liquid ox uh, all their compressed oxygen fuel immediately went up in a colossal explosion, which basically crippled the ship and uh, meant that uh, from that point it was effectively dead and would would sink later on so yeah it was a, a full-scale fleet unit a heavy cruiser with an awful lot of firepower going off up against a ship that in theory should have lost even against the heavy cruiser's secondary battery but it was taken out with one shot one very lucky shot but one shot nonetheless yeah one of those three shots so the final question that i have is actually um what do you expect for kind of the future of torpedoes will they become obsolete with very fast rockets or just are they always kind of this threat and will they remain a threat like sea mines i suspect they will remain a threat um in part from anything else um the the single biggest thing that torpedoes have going in their favor at the moment is that they are the most effective weapon of sinking ships that a, and especially other submarines, that a submarine has in its arsenal. Um, you cannot sink a submarine with a missile. Um, you can only sink a submarine with a torpedo or if you're very, very lucky at the charge. Um, so they're always going to be needed to engage other submarines. And ultimately when you are engaging surface ships it's much much better to let water in the bottom than it is to blow holes that let air in the top 
um, and with the modern modern weight of warhead and the under keel detonations that they do, pretty much anything short of a super carrier can be one shotted by a decent torpedo hit, and even super carriers are vulnerable to crippling damage or possibly even fatal damage from a from a well placed torpedo with a large warhead. The advances that I suspect we're going to see in the future are going to centre around, I suspect, stealth and speed, which is, I mean, it's always been the, the watchwords of torpedoes, but um, the, two, the thing is the torpedoes now, their range is such that, as we said before, they've got a very small sensor package because of the size of them, which means you need to get them as close to the enemy as possible, but you may well be launching from a range far beyond your torpedo sensors, so you have to guide them in. Um, so the closer you can get them to the enemy, the better, because that means the less time they've got to react, which means you can then hopefully cut the wires and get out of there before they even notice where you are. And then once the torpedo's up and running at full speed, obviously the faster they're going, the less likely it is for the enemy to escape. and. Uh, again, the less time they have to react. So, although the Spearfish is the current conventional speed record holder for torpedoes by a long way, I suspect that when the next generation of torpedoes uh, comes out, a lot of them are going to be trying to match that. Okay. So, the final kind of picture in my head that I wanted to get answered is, let's talk about capital ships, you know, First World War, Second World War, and even some modern carriers um, against a torpedo that is fired and is running in a straight line. And it is perfectly aimed, if you do not take any sort of evasive actions, is perfectly aimed at your midsection. How fast can you actually dodge it? How do you dodge it? And um, how much warning do you need to actually successfully do so? And how much does it vary between the capital ships from a heavy cruiser to a you know small relatively maneuverable battleship as battleship goes to well the Yamato class? So uh, battleships have what's called a tactical radius, which is uh, the distance that they need to complete to actually turn themselves around. Um, and the tactical radius of battleships varies. Uh, to a degree, the most manoeuvrable ones could sort of be somewhere down around 600 yards. The less manoeuvrable ones may be anything up to 900 to 1,000 yards. So um, that tells you how much distance they need to turn. And when, if you're talking about a theoretical torpedo that's aimed dead center at a battleship that's uh, proceeding along, then in order for it to be able to take the correct evasive action, which is probably going to consist of, in pure mathematical terms, is probably going to consist of it slamming on the metaphorical brakes and turning hard into the torpedoes um, to minimize its target profile, then you realistically, given the reaction time that you've got to see the torpedo, realize what's happening, decide what you're going to do, and then actually initiate the turn on the ship and the reduction in engine power, you probably need to be seeing that torpedo at maybe 1,200 yards, 12 to 1,400 yards. So you're talking about uh, about a kilometer to a kilometer and a half. And at that point, you can probably slow the ship and turn the ship enough that the torpedo will run past ahead of you. Um, of course, the slightly more conservative but slightly riskier option is to tur is to slow your speed and turn away from the torpedo um, or even if you're not traveling at full speed maybe even push the speed up higher and turn away from the torpedo and try and get past it that way but in all cases you're probably talking about um, a kilometer to a kilometer and a half is probably your minimum safe distance uh, to spot one where at least uh, world war ii a period where you could reasonably expect to out out maneuver it and Maybe if you're in one of the more maneuverable ships, maybe that could go down to 800 meters or so. But anything much inside that, if you start reacting after that point, you are probably going to get hit. Um, a lot of the evasive 
uh, action that took part in World War II where ships did manage to dodge torpedoes, especially battleships like, say, uh, the Repulse for the first part of the action uh, where it was eventually sunk, more involve outthinking your opponent than outguessing the torpedo. So um, you would start to turn before the torpedo was dropped or launched by guessing where your opponent was going to drop his torpedo um, and start to take action even before it entered the water. Okay, so torpedoes, they have quite an interesting history from the early days in the 1860s to the modern days that are still relevant. They are very effective at sinking ships with the various different uh, um, fuses that they have or the detonation mechanisms. Um, there will be still room for improvement and development, so they will be a weapon that is very likely to be still found uh, on the seas in the future. So thank you very much, Drakinifal. Um, if you guys enjoyed um, our, us talking, then be sure to check his channel out and enjoy his five minute guides. And um, I hope that we will do some more cooperations in the future. So again, for all of you, let me know in the comment section if you are interested in this kind of talks, which kind of um, overall topic in terms of sea warfare you're interested in. And um, yeah, the last word is to you. Oh, thank you very much. Um, I've enjoyed this chat as much as I did with the uh, chat on Minds, and so hopefully um, the listeners will enjoy this enough to uh, make this an ongoing thing. Um, although now having covered mines and torpedoes, we are, we're probably fast running out of naval weapons that we can talk about. We might have to diversify a little bit, but that's never a bad thing. Um, and uh, yeah, hopefully I will uh, see all the various people who are hopefully commenting now as we speak in the uh, comments below, uh, both on your channel and on mine. Okay, so thank you very much. That's also it for me today. I think we have managed to shorten this uh, ongoing rambling by a quite substantial amount. Um, the last talk that we did was 80 minutes. This is uh, roughly around uh, 60 minutes, if I'm not mistaken. And yeah, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Again, let, let us know your opinions and suggestions in the comment section down below. Give this video a like if you did, subscribe if you want to see more, and we'll see each other on the waves of War Thunder.